Good. Uh, my name is Chris McNeil. I'm an independent consultant uh, living on the South Island at the moment. I've used uh, Microsoft products for about 12 years, well, a bit more than 12 years now, since about 2005. Uh, I used to run a small wireless ISP in Scotland before I immigrated to New Zealand. And I'm just going to give you a, a fairly dry presentation this morning. Uh, apologies, there aren't much in the way of graphics. I'm a techie, not a graphical artist, so there is one slide a bit later on which is uh, a graphic. Um, and this really comes out of the uh, three presentations that were made at the NZ NOG uh, in January. Uh, those of you that did attend NZ NOG, uh, you may find this uh, a little bit boring and switch off. Uh, some of the others may uh, find this a bit boring anyway and switch off. Um, really what I'm trying to promote here uh, is a bit of debate. There seems to be still a lot of confusion about what TIXA is and who it actually affects. Now, there seems to be a little bit of debate on some forums in the past, um, but there doesn't seem to be much conversation been going on recently. So, certainly in my personal circumstance, really until January, I hadn't heard of TIXA at all. Now, this obviously shows there hasn't been much in the way of uh, uh, decent public, uh, uh, published or attempts by um, GCSB and police and whoever to um, promote this. I believe there have been some road shows and whatever, but I certainly haven't been aware of any. Now, one of the things is that for smaller operators, a lot of people think, well, does this really actually affect me? Well, primarily if you are a network operator, which is basically anybody providing network services in New Zealand, which are either voice or data-based, you have to comply to some degree. A lot of people have been just saying, well, am I really ever going to get caught if I do nothing? Well, yeah, eventually somebody is going to do something nasty on your network and it may well be served with a warrant. And at that point, you're going to have to do something. So at this point here, I'm really saying, these opinions in this slide are my own. I don't think there's really any experts in this field yet. And part of the reason for that is I don't think anybody's actually been prosecuted under the Act yet. So you can read through all the various summaries that there are available. And there are one or two, but to be honest, they're not a lot better than actually reading through the Act. The Act itself, unfortunately, is uh, pretty hard to going. Um, it's legalese. Uh, it's hard to translate that into practical English language. And there are quite a few contradictions and areas where people that are experts in writing law aren't really experts in running networks. Um, personally, I've gone through the various summaries that I've seen. The, uh, the one from TCF, well, that's pretty useless. Um, hopefully, I'm not putting anybody's nose out of joint here that's part of TCF, but their website They've got a summary for the old Act, which was the 2009 one, but they say on their own page that they haven't updated it for the 2013 Act. So since the 2013 Act supersedes the previous one, the information on their web page is no longer relevant. The information on the GCSB and NCSC website, well, they're only concerned about part three of the Act, so they just refer you to the NZ Police for part two. So you can go and have a look at the NZ Police website and the NZ Police stuff, I find, again, a little bit confusing, and it's their particular viewpoint on the Act. So the Act itself, um, you can go onto the government website and get the whole Act in full. It comes in four parts. The first part is just really defining things. Part two, the lawful intercept. That's pretty much only going to affect people who actually sell a service. So if you're a network operator and you're merely operating that network for your own purposes, then you're not um, going to be involved with part two of the Act. That will be um, dealt with by your up upstream provider. Part three, though, 
but it's less clear. It certainly covers uh, companies that are providing services for reward, but there is some indications in the Act that Part 3 does actually also cover other people as well. And Part 4 of the Act just covers uh, registration and, enfo uh, and enforcement. So who's affected by Part 3? I've gone on to that a little bit. So if all your services are relabeled whole wholesale services, you don't have to comply with TIXA. If you applied for and received an, uh, an exemption, you don't have to comply. You can actually apply for an exemption on any grounds whatsoever. And you can apply as many times as you like, as long as each application materially differs from the previous one. And if your uh, request for exemption is rejected by the registrar, you can actually appeal to the minister as well. But if you appeal to the minister, you can't change your mind and change the content of the uh, appeal. It's got to be on the same grounds as the original appeal. So if you are running a, a network and you do actually have VoIP services or an email server or some kind of authentication server within your network, so that authentication server is either Radius or and or DHCP or something else that provides the same services, you will likely have to um, comply with the Act. Also, that, that's uh, only for uh, network operators within New Zealand. But if you provide a, a service of some kind outside New Zealand, but to New Zealand suppliers, uh, sorry, New Zealand end users, you may also have to comply. However, I don't quite see how New Zealand law enforcement actually has any jurisdiction on overseas companies. If, you, if an overseas company has an office here, then there is some uh, possible comeback they have. Um, but I suspect this has been put into the Act so that they can liaise with other uh, law enforcement agencies overseas to gain access to that information about NZ users. So things like Gmail and uh, Outlook Mail. So you can apply for an exemption. Unfortunately, I've already covered a little bit of this. Uh, you can migrate to white um, label services. So if you currently have email or VoIP within your network, you could choose to offload that to another supplier. The only slight problem there is the Act does actually give wholesalers the entitlement to charge you for doing that tix compliance. So whether that will happen or not, no one else to say. And lastly, if you really don't want to comply, you could just sell your business and go and put your feet up somewhere and let somebody else worry about the Act. So there's two levels for part two. To be honest, there's really not a lot of difference between the two levels. Um, they do give you the, the threshold of above and below 4,000 users, and that's a, an average over a rolling six-month period. You have to report, sorry, you have to record the, same, the number of customers on the same working day each month. Now, that's only an internal record, and I think most people that would want to perhaps automate that, it seems a bit odd to have to do it on the same working day. If you're wanting to do it automatically, you perhaps want to do it on the same day each month, uh, irrespective of whether it's a working day or not. Once your average goes above 4,000, you have 10 working days to then report that fact to the registrar. Now, the Act doesn't say um, what happens if you go below the 4,000. Do you actually have to tell the, uh, the registrar that you've gone below? Come on, next page. So, Intercept Ready, that's basically the, small, the very smallest operators. Primarily, this is just a matter that you have to have put things in place so that you're ready to do the intercept as and when a warrant comes in. Now, the issue is that if a warrant comes in, you're likely to have to um, 
put this in place pretty quickly. So you have to make sure you have documented all of this, put it in place, and you've agreed a format with the registrar or with the, or the NZ police on how that data is going to be forwarded. You have to maintain that readiness and you have to be able to demonstrate that if the registrar comes knocking on the door and says, I want to do a test. If you're over 4,000 customers, you have to be intercept re ready, or in some places it's called intercept capable, sorry, intercept accessible or intercept, ca internet intercept capable. Pretty much the same, but instead of reserving the port and uh, reserving the bandwidth, you physically have to have allocated that. So hence, I don't see an awful lot of difference between the two. The forwarding format, a lot of people seem to think that all they can do is mirror a port and just send raw data straight to the police port. Now, one of the things in the NZ police presentation was they did emphasize that PCAP or um, either streamed or as uh, capture packets sent is not acceptable. And the act does actually say you've got to negotiate with them. So the police have said they want it in Etsy format or another format as agreed. But I'm not quite sure how the police can say you've got to do it in Etsy and the act says you can negotiate. So I guess if the police say they're not going to accept anything else, they're not going to do it. So this kind of puts the features in the MicroTik uh, product into um, question, since the Calia format is basically just captured PCAPs sent periodically. So if we take uh, NZ Police at face value, Calia is not acceptable. There is one general exception that has been put in place so far and that is merely relaxing the reporting period. In the Act, it says you have to report every six months. They've relaxed that to every 12 months. But that's just your yearly report. If you exceed the uh, 4,000 threshold, then you've uh, still got the 10 days uh, to notify. So one of the issues with the NZ Police wanting Etsy is there aren't many solutions out there. Um, it's a highly complex standard. Uh, it's been implemented by a few large um, software providers, but this is very large sums of money. It's not been fully implemented, and according to those that know better, it's not truly scalable. So one of the things that was brought up at uh, NZNOG is a project that's being uh, funded by uh, a few people called WAND, which is part of Waikato University, um, to do some open source development. So for smaller operators, this uh, gives some opportunity to do things at uh, hopefully a reasonable cost. One of the problem is, is obviously everybody's networks are different. So how much integration is required to actually provide the information the police require is going to vary. Uh, you may have those capabilities and the time to do that integration yourself. Uh, if you don't and you have to bring in a consultant, then obviously it's going to cost a lot of money. At the moment, uh, I just spoke to Shane, or at least I emailed with Shane last week to get an update before I did the presentation. Uh, they're basically in the final stages of coding and they're going to be issuing the software to their foundation contributors next month and hopefully fine-tuning that and then um, progressing on from any bug fixes and implementation issues. They're hoping to make that more widely available later in the year. Uh, but the timescales at the moment are a little bit questionable. The implementation of OpenLI um, at the moment is just purely a uh, network layer. So it's pulling off the raw IP, and in the case of VoIP, it's interpreting SIP and doing some special stuff at uh, that level to encapsulate it in a, in a manner that's suitable for the Etsy 
um, propagation. One thing that I pointed out to Shane was SIP isn't the only VoIP protocol. We've got IAX2 as well. Um, they hadn't thought of that, so IAX2 is not on the roadmap at the moment, um, but since I've highlighted it to them, they're adding that to the list of things that need to be done. Now, one of the issues is I've, in reading through the Act, there's a lot more information that you need to provide when there's a lawful intercept. And this is where there's a bit of a, a disagreement in how I read things and maybe how things are happening on the ground. Because Shane, apparently, uh, has had indications from NCSC and police that they're primarily interested in either raw IP or in VoIP traffic at the moment. They're not particularly interested in email, which surprises me a little bit. Uh, the Act does require that if you provide encryption for any service, so that would be if you've, you've got an email server that's providing SSL TLS layer encryption, in theory, you have to provide the raw content of those emails via the intercept. And the only way really to do that is with some kind of shim integration or with some kind of proxy that will sit in front of the uh, email server uh, maintain the, the privacy, at least at uh, a supposed level from the point of view of the user, for transport, but also give access to the uh, plain text email um, whenever lawful intercept is required. So I can certainly see OpenLI being a start, um, but I suspect that's going to need a lot more work over time. So here's my picture one and only, and basically the lawful intercepts are those sort of blue colored boxes. They're basically same um, separate processes that can either run on the same server or could be um, geographically split. And it's basically capturing the information from the network, taking information from radius and various other um, uh, parts of the system to integrate metadata, which would include um, information about when an IP address is used. Uh, if, it, if an end user has a dynamic address, then obviously that's going to change from time to time. So you need to be able to track those changes and uh, encapsulate that with the information that's passed back to the, the uh, LEA. So here, here's one of the con um, contradictions that I found in the Act. There apparently there are mechanisms for getting some kind of monetary compensation, but it's a bit unclear as to under what grounds you can get those costs. And you have two sections adjacent in the Act which appear to completely contra contradict each other. Section 24 of the Act is just defining what you actually do when a warrant lands on your desk. So section 115 says, yes, you can recover actual and reasonable costs. And then 116 goes on to say, uh, actually, no, you can't. So anybody's guess as to whether you can or you cannot uh, get compensation. And given that there is a contradiction, I suspect that the LEAs will push that it's the no compensation path. So part three. Um, this is somewhat different. Um, it's trying to keep the NZ telecommunica telecommunications networks secure from any form of attack or problems with products that there may be loopholes in. So you may be exempt under part two of the act, but you could be caught under part three of the act. So basically, if you have one customer that is in one of the sectors listed there, you are required to conform to that part three of the act. The only exemptions at the moment are any uh, installations that were done before 2014 or anything where it is a ge direct or like generic like-for-like -like replacement. But if you're replacing something 
even from the same manufacturer, but in a slightly different product set, you may well have to report that you're wanting to make that change, and you have to report and get permission to do it before you do it, except if it's uh, an actual outage and you, you have to do it because the actual old product is no longer available. I've got a little bit ahead of myself there. So a few examples. If you've got um, hardware from a, a, a different manufacturer and you're replacing it with Microtik, you must discuss that uh, with the GCSB NCSC before you implement it. So if you say, uh, also potentially, if you're replacing something like a, a RB2011 with a cloud core router, they have different CPUs. So under the Act, that is materially different. And although they're running the same operating system, there may be some hard le hardware level concerns. And one of the problems with the NCSC reporting regime is they don't give you any information up front to say, do they want you to actually tell them about certain things? They say, tell us, and then we'll tell you whether you need to tell us or not. So you've got to go through all their forms process and actually um, go through the hoops. It would be actually quite useful if they could actually publish a list of things that have already been approved. It does seem a bit daft to have to individually approve every request. So if you're using the same hardware, but for some reason you want to change from using router OS, say, to OpenWRT, then again, you'd have to seek permission for that because that's a change. But if you're replacing, say, an RB750 with a 2011, both got MIPS PE CPUs, yeah, you're free to do that, no problem. Don't have to report that. So here are the actual uh, presentations that were made at NZNOG. Uh, all of the NZNOG sessions are on YouTube. So these are the, we're in the session three, if you go onto YouTube. And these are the timings at which those presentations were within that particular um, stream that's on, the, on YouTube. I would recommend that you take some time if you haven't already seen those presentations. It is worthwhile going through them. There is a bit more detail than what I've been able to go through here. So in summary, if you're a network operator, you've got to register with the NZ police. You must become LI accessible already. You must communicate proactively to GCSB and NCSC. And where applicable, apply for exemptions as it will make life a lot easier. And just banging my own drum a little bit here. Uh, again, I'm an independent IT consultant, so I can help you out if you don't want to be doing some of these things yourself. I can do these various things listed, and also, if there is demand for it, I may be interested in doing a lawful intercept as a service at some point. Um, if you have talked to uh, the various bodies that you need to, the fact that you've signed up a contract for some kind of lawful intercept service may well help you uh, in the long run, since that's a tick in the box. Uh, I have done work in the past for a number of high security organizations throughout Europe and North America. Uh, not yet an NZ uh, citizen, so not sure whether I can do it still with my British citizenship, but uh, it's certainly something that I may be doing. Um, if you have somebody within your organization or a third party that is security cleared, there's obviously a higher level of information that NCSC can provide. Uh, which will enable you to make decisions before you put forward any proposals to NCSC. So that's really the end of my presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll take them. Uh, if not, uh, you can always contact me through my website. Thank you.